Welcome, 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 welcome back to the Backyard Basketball Podcast. Brought to you by the Ordinary Podcasting Network. I am Braden Ellick Holtman. I'm joined, as always, by my good buddy Christian Steck. What's going on, Chris? Not much, buddy. How are you doing? I'm doing well. I'm doing well. Um, Chris has kindly graced us with a, a little bit of um, flavor for this podcast uh, tonight. Uh, Chris, why don't you tell everybody what uh, what we're going to be uh, sipping on tonight? Uh, we're we're sipping on some of my favorite scotch, uh, some Ardbeg uh, Ugadale, Oog- if I'm pronouncing that correctly. Uh, Ardbeg, uh, you know, uh, sponsor us. Um, we love drinking your scotch. So I'm not sure we can say we. I, I do it. Um, I do it because I'm a good friend. Um, my relationship to scotch is not the same as yours, but I will uh, p- take part in tonight's episode. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm glad. I'm glad you're take. Glad you're taking part. Yeah, we'll do a lot of these uh, over the pod. Just a lot of. Yeah. Right, so we're gonna be uh, we're gonna be hits the spot. <laughs> we talk more basketball today. Um, we got some betting going on. We're gonna make some bets. We're gonna talk a little bit more about um, the retirement Lakers, um, and I think we're gonna be continuing to talk about the retirement Lakers all season long, um, and much much more. So let's get going. All right, Chris. Um, first question I want to ask you here, right off the hop: What the hell is gonna happen to Ben Simmons? Ben Simmons has formally announced today that he no longer wants to take part in a uh, training camp with the Philadelphia 76ers. He does not want to be a part of this team. This saga continues. What's going to happen to our guy, Ben Simmons? Well, I feel like it could be more interesting to ask you this question first, because I feel like I, you already kind of know uh, how I've felt. See, when you sign a contract, it doesn't matter what you're doing. If you're playing basketball, if you're working for a company, like this is part of your job. And I get it. You know, there's been this whole like player empowerment era that still started with LeBron James. But in this particular situation to be like, hey, yo, I want out. I'm not even going to come to training camp. Like the amount of leverage, even though it's being profuse on social media, I think is like incredibly limited. Um, in Ben Simmons case, unfortunately, mm-hmm. uh, I mean, I know with clutch, they're probably working tirelessly to try and find options for him, but I, see, this is, this is Daryl Morey's, um, you know, this is his play and he is really holding out to get that big bang. That's, that's what he wants. And again, I, I, I expressed this a little bit last week in the podcast that this upcoming 2022, um, off season, is like very limited in terms of free agents. Like I think you have a couple Brooklyn players, Harden, um, Kyrie Irving. A lot of these guys are going to re up. So you're automatically, like I said last week, like your top player, you're probably going to be looking at is, you know, um, an individual. Uh, it's so funny. I can't even think of his name right now from Chicago. Um, <laughs> I was so excited about him last week. Zach Levine. Uh, Z- Zach Levine. That's right. Uh-huh. Like he, you know, he is what you're looking at in terms of the off season next year. And obviously Chicago even made a play. So he might not even be on the table. So your best bet, if you're an NBA team looking to move the needle this season is at the NBA trade deadline. That is, I think where a lot of the moving in the shaking is going to happen. Um, and I think that's when Daryl Morey is going to want to quote unquote, you know, swing for the fences and even if he doesn't get it, and we know what his number one pick is, it's, it's Damian Lillard out of Portland. That's what he wants. He wants to trade Damian Lillard for Ben Simmons and some other, I don't know, package some other asset, couple picks or whatever. Um, but he wants Damian Lillard on the Philadelphia 76ers. Obviously, Portland's trying desperately. Okay, they got a new coach in Chauncey Billups, which we don't know. I think regardless, Damian Lillard will come around and, and probably have a relative respectable relationship um, with Chauncey Billups as the new coach. And, you know, you've got McCollum, you've got Nurchich, you've got Nor- our boy Norman Powell on the team, um, Covington, uh, you know, obviously adding Larry Nance Jr. is a great asset um, for their team. So, you know, they have like some pieces next year that they could put themselves in, say, the top four out of the West, as, as competitive as it is. 
Uh, so if things are going good for the first half of the season, like, you know, Damian Lillard might be like, yo, I'm good. You know, like I'm happy with the situation that I'm in. We're competing in a top four spot going into the playoffs. And we know like every year Portland's always a really good regular season team. Yeah. They choke like crazy in the playoffs. Uh, but if there's hope and, and Damian Lillard can see it, like, of course he isn't going to go anywhere. And regardless, I don't think he's scared to go in training camp in the start of the season with Ben Simmons in the lineup as discontent him or the fans or the other players or whoever may be in this situation. And this is like significantly quite right opportunity presents itself. So yeah. Yeah. Does, does Sam Presti get involved here? Does OKC with all of their, their myriad of picks they've dealt with Daryl Morey before. They have, but is that what Philly really wants right now? Like you got Joel Embiid in his prime, you know, you're tied up with these other hat assets and Tobias Harris. Um, do you, do you want to, uh, put confidence in a player that obviously hasn't really shown confidence these past couple of years when you know these undermine the effects of not only the um, name and likeness rule that the NCAA has imposed so players can make their own money so they feel more inclined to you know continue and go to college you've also got the G League um, which we had an instance this season of a couple of amazing players and Jalen Green and, and Kaminga, you know, coming from there, <coughs> you know, there's even this Scotty Barnes, <laughs> you even have this, um, uh, this organization with Jeff Bezos, Drake, uh, Kevin Durant. Uh, I wish I could say the name of it on the top of my head. Anybody could quickly search in those three guys and an NBA organization and probably find the name quite easily. Um, but here's an organization where like, you know, significantly rich entrepreneurs are dumping tons of money to incentivize not only players at the senior level, but like at the, the junior and the sophomore level as well, too, to come over and, and play for a couple of years and make some money. Like they, they, they're hiring kids that are 16 and seven years old and sign them on million dollar contracts. They're main, making like a million dollars for a year. Like, could yeah. you imagine that at 16 and 17? And so this and startup, the startup that you're thinking here, the sport media startup, it's called Overtime. That's it. Yeah. yeah. Overtime. Yeah. So like there's a lot of diversity. And with that, this is just my opinion. Like I feel like when guys were taking players straight out of high school is that you had an overabundance of ways to find your talent, not necessarily talent in general, but ways and avenues to explore. And so the job and the onus is really on the teams, the scouting, the organization to do their due diligence, to find those respective players. But you know, because the pool is so widespread that you're going to have, you know, some really good chances to bring in players that are going to be way better than Ben Simmons. So if I was pressy, I'd be like, nah, I'm good. I'm well, I, I think I think too in this day and age now, scouts are going to have to be a lot more creative uh, with how they with how they go and research these players uh, in the midst of COVID. Um, we're not getting full seasons. We're not getting a lot of um, the attendance, maybe that they're allowed to you know to to be able to get there. We're getting video, which is a lot different than watching players um, in in person. Um, the atmosphere. The, the one part here that makes me think of. Um, uh, what you're saying here is, is the efforts that Masai Ujiri has put in with Global Africa. Um, mm. That's another huge avenue. I I really thought that Masai was going to leave and be this huge CEO of of you know the the, the emergence of uh, Global Africa and 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 what that organization is for the world. Very excited that he stuck around with the Raptors. But uh, when you talk about like, you know, the, the emergence of this new G league team and, and college kind of not being the only, you know, the sole um, um, feeder league or, you know, uh, for, for these young guys, I think, I think the NBA has a really exciting new opportunity for um, globalization and for, for um, players coming out of places that, perhaps we haven't seen before. I mean, even like at the MVP, the last couple of years, like you're getting, you know, and I, I feel like there probably is a bit of a pendulum effect in terms, if you looked at the history of the league, you know, European players getting a lot of accolades and then you're getting players at home, getting a lot of accolades in terms of their success. In these last few years, we're seeing a huge abundance out of Africa, Europe, other places around the world of some amazingly talented individuals. And I feel like we're just kind of at the tipping point where, the further we go down this path of different avenues and exactly like you said, I mean, it's an amazing organization, what they're doing there in Africa and how quickly it's grown. 
um, you're just going to see this overabundance with time. Maybe it takes a decade, who knows, of just players um, overseas that could at maybe one point really be running the league in terms of talent. So time will tell. All right, man. The Ben Simmons thing, you know, that's pretty much essentially kind of what's been in the news these days. I have this cool idea. Uh, I'm calling it buying or selling. We're, we're stock traders here. <laughs> and essentially, I'm just going to throw something. Are you buying or selling? And, and you, you let me know, all right? Okay, <clears throat> my first question. <sighs> Why does whiskey taste like this? <laughs> <sighs> well, I'm buying. Um, I'm buying all the Ardbeg Oogadale stock. Another shameless advertising plug. Even um, fire over here. Oh, it's so good, man. It's so good. It just it hits a sweet spot. Uh, speaking of sweet spot, uh, buying or selling, Kevin Love. Uh, <laughs> just in general? <laughs> yeah, yeah, literally. No, uh, I'm selling. I was, I was, okay, finish your, finish your question. Well, well, okay, in terms of buying, quote-unquote, buyout, um, Kevin oh. Love <laughs> has $31.3 million uh, he's owed next year and $28.9 million the year after. Um, so an insane amount of money for a player that sits on the bench pretty much behind Laurie Markin and now it looks like moving forward. How old is Kevin uh, Love now? It's like 35? 33. I think he's around 33. All right. All right. So he's still, you know, um, it sounds like he's not going to buy out. Uh, so he rides out the two years of the contract or they can trade him again. I don't know who the hell is going to mm. trade <laughs> for that much money that's owing for a team, but still, yeah, I know, I know one team. We already talked about them. Okay. So first and foremost, I'm selling. Um, but if I'm Kevin Love, obviously I'm not wanting to take a buyout. I, I want to run this thing through. And and I think pride is involved there too. But like I said in our previous podcast, Kevin Love has not shown that he uh, has the effort or intensity that it takes to be an NBA player anymore. Um, Shots fired. Damn. Well, I, I, I'm not just, these aren't just, this isn't just a hot take. This is, this is, I'm seeing this on the court. Like, and then, and anybody who watches his games can see that he's not putting in the work that, that he once put in. He was a really, really great basketball player. Uh, he won a championship. Uh, and I think now he's sitting on a team that, you know, they're not with LeBron anymore. They're not with those star players anymore. And he's kind of the, the lone survivor there with all of this. He can see the young team building around him. Anyway, I think the only way he gets out of this situation is if um, Sam Presti <laughs> makes a trade and Cleveland in, it includes a, a first. Like, I think that's the only way they can move that contract is that if they, um, if they ship out some assets with him. Um, otherwise, yeah, he's going to have to ride it out and it's going to be it's going to be a, a, an unfortunate situation for Cleveland. Is it? Is it? I mean, I guess it is, but and then, like, I, I don't think I, he's as I don't think he's a helpful player anymore. Is Al Horford a helpful player here? Like oh for God, me, the, don't even. Well, so here's the thing. You, you get these star players who get big money and they turn, they, they get to the other side of 30. And if they're not on a championship or a contending team, uh, you see, you see their productivity start to decline. And I think that that's exactly point in case here with Kevin Love. Uh, I won't get too far into Al Horford because we're going to spend a lot of time with uh, Boston uh, in the upcoming season here, but. Uh, I, I just, I think that Kevin Love is in the situation here where he's being paid to be a, a specific kind of star and all he's doing is pouting on the court. And I don't, I don't, I don't think that's good. Well, so I'm selling his ass. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I'd, I'd probably be selling as well too, but the one caveat I would say to that, you know, like an example of it would be Blake Griffin yeah, and man. you know, like Blake Same Griffin situation. on the Detroit Pistons. And it was one of those things where like, maybe, I don't know, certain mechanical technical things are like, you know, having fog brain on the defensive end and they're missing out on cues or what have you. But overall, it feels like this consensus of energy and effort. Yeah. And, and also I know it's not necessarily the case in Kevin Love's situation, but when Blake Griffin was on Detroit, like he was having to carry the workload, like he was playing, you know, 36 minutes. And so there were certain limitations in knowing within himself what he could and couldn't do. And the reality is 
unfortunately because of his injuries, he just isn't that player that That's can right. really produce at a high level for those amount of minutes. However, seeing like how he performed on Brooklyn last year, it makes me think that if there is a team out there, I don't know if it's golden state or maybe, you know, um, Denver somehow or Portland, you know, wants to take an opportunity. I don't know if you knew this, but apparently I was reading on this earlier, Kevin Love pretty much essentially wrote like a love letter to Portland. <laughs> and he, I, I don't, I don't know if he originally was from there, or what it was, but like he talked about how much he loved that team, and he talked about being in the arena. He kissed his first girlfriend at what? the Portland Arena and stuff what? like this. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. This stuff. He's not my... from there. He's from LA, isn't he? I so might. He might be, but maybe LA? he spent some time up there or something. Who knows? But like he has, it seems like these sentimental feelings toward Portland. So I don't know, but like a team like know. that, could you see? Kevin Love turning around, turning around in a short period of time in terms of that effort and energy, like you said with Blake Griffin. Well, yeah, the only way is a buyout. The only way it works on any of those teams is a buyout True. because they can't afford that kind of money to bring him in to be a, you know, to be a Marcus Gasol, to be a, you know, a veteran uh, guy who I just, I just don't see, uh, I just don't see his game anymore. That's that's really where the buck stops with me. I don't see his game. I. I you know, yeah, that's pretty much it. Anyhow, let's let's leave that there. Like the Lakers, uh, like like him moving to the Lakers. Let's talk about um, a, a new addition to the Lakers' depth, Rajon Rondo, signing for um, a whopping two point seven mil. I think for insane. Uh, yeah, it's like here. Do you want to do you want to just play with us? Because this is all we have. Um, here's my buy or sell for you. Rondo and Westbrook as teammates. Are you buying or selling? Buying. How does it work? It, it, well, it works because of LeBron. Because LeBron is the boss. LeBron is the captain. LeBron is the leader. Everything runs through LeBron. LeBron. And, and he's the boss. Um, I mean, it'll be, it, there'll be an, of course, there's an interesting dynamic in the two of them in practice and in games, having those conversations because we're the true asset in Rondo lies. And that's why when I saw this happen, I was like, holy shit. Like, I think this is huge, like huge, huge deal because the greatest asset that Rondo ever brought the year that the Lakers ended up winning, uh, not last year, but the year before now um, is the mental acuity and Rondo's brain and the bronze brain on the same team make the best brain duo in the whole NBA. You think Rondo's IQ is higher than, than most of the players on the Lakers team? I would say Rondo's basketball IQ. Yeah. That's what, that's what I mean. Is, is on par with okay. LeBron James basketball IQ. I think it's that good. I think that's the best asset he brings to the table. Rajan Rondo is going to be a head coach in the NBA at some point. Ooh, that'd be and great to see. And he's going to be a phenomenal coach. He's he going to be ejected cha- he will win like a championship. every game. He's going to be ejected more games than he actually gets to coach. Yeah, yeah. Well, maybe early on, he has to have a he has to have a really good team with him. Okay. Well, so yeah. <laughs> so you're so you're buying this emotions buying buying it 100. percent And you want to hear a cool thing that I, I found out Always. recently about the Lakers. So the Lakers have seven All Stars on their team this year: Westbrook, LeBron, Melo, Rondo, Dwight Howard, Marcus Saul, and Anthony Davis. That's seven. Damn. Do you know when the last time in the NBA there were seven All Stars on one team? Uh, Just 90s. shoot for a shoot for a decade. Yeah, the nineties. No, it's not the nineties. Nineteen eighty-seven. The Celtics had oh, wow. Ainge. Ainge, Bird, Gilmore, Dennis Johnson, Mikhail, Parrish, and Paxton on that team. Wow, that's a good team, man. Isn't that sick? How old were they, though? Oh, uh, well, Bird, Bird was literally on one leg. <laughs> um, uh, or no legs at that and point. And probably still productive. Yeah, yeah, he was pretty productive yeah. uh, through excruciating amounts of pain. See, the, um, thing, with, the thing with this, this Lakers team is if they can stay healthy, that will be the deal breaker. Because if they yeah. can't, they they're hooped. They're absolutely hooped. AD goes down. LeBron goes down. They're hooped. They're in trouble for sure, for sure. That was but a I basketball mean that... pun. That was a basketball reference. <laughs> I missed it. They're I, literally I, hooped. I've drank. I've drank too much uh, scotch. Hard brick. 
uh, <laughs> uh, to success. Um, yeah, I mean, but this is a, I think there's a lot of teams. I mean, a clear example. I mean, look at Brooklyn last year, right? Like that yeah, was definitely right. the perennial favorites. And, and injury plays a huge factor. And it was a crazy anomaly having a shortened season coming off. A yeah, but you know what was shortened that really determined their season last year? Um, Katie's foot size. <laughs> See, if Katie's toes or like if Boom, he flipped booms. his nails, they might have actually made it to the finals. So, <laughs> Well, and apparently he likes to wear or like a size, I think, larger than his actual yeah, feet size. He's going to be like reconsidering that next year. Yeah, I know, right? So, all right. All right. Well, I'm I'm buying it too. You know, like what I what I really like about Rondo is his intensity, and what I really love about Westbrook is the exact same thing: his intensity. Now, put those two guys on the same court on different teams. Obviously, you're going to see them bat uh, bash heads with one another. But you put them on the same team it's it's gonna be scary it's gonna be scary to go up against those guys like they're they're gonna bring a world of intensity that uh that's gonna make it difficult for any component or they won't uh, any team any night they won't be the most talented team in the nba this season but i think they will be the smartest team in the nba this season and I, I don't know. That's my opinion, but I think that's a really cool observation going into this year is looking at, you know, Brooklyn, who is this team that's so filled with talent, so, so much ability. And then you have this Lakers team that is so experienced, so wise, and then also has the such, such brains on one team. Um, it'll be really interesting to see how these two teams complement and clash with one another. Nice. Um, it's for us, the NBA. Okay, buying or selling. So uh, right now, the 2021-2022 uh, NBA MVP odds recently Ooh. came out. Who uh, First off, who would you guess is number one for, for MVP for next season? Giannis. Uh, nope. Luca. Luca. Luca Doncic, yeah, yeah, man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's, uh, oh, well, he's... I, I had to put some... I had to put some uh... Plout on on the championships or the you know he's a champion. Giannis is a champion now. He will forever be known as a champion. He's gonna have a great year next year. But but I he think will. you're I think you're right. I think Luca's gonna so, take another step forward. All that hookah, uh, all that off season hookah smoking. <laughs> Again, boom boom. Uh, uh, so are you buying or selling Luka Doncic for MVP for next season? Oh yeah, oh yeah, I'm buying that absolutely. I don't think he's going to have the team that can make it to the finals, but I do think uh, I do think that he has a very good shot at uh, at taking home the uh, the MVP next year. Do you think they'll win a series in the playoffs next year, yeah. Dallas? Yeah, yeah, that's that's good. Yeah, we got so Luca's number one, Joel Embiid is coming in second, then Kevin Durant, Giannis Antetokounmpo, Steph, Dame Lillard, LeBron James, and wow, LeBron's Jokic. like six or seven there, and Jokic is. Man, that, see, that's a bit, that's rude. <laughs> <laughs> it is, it is, but you know, it, it is what it is. Uh, it just, I don't know, man. Denver, they, they feel, they feel beatable. They, they do. And, and maybe part of parcel is due to injury, but. Well, that's just, just it. Like they, we didn't really get to see the full extent of what Denver could do in the playoffs without Jamal Murray. Yeah. Um, and with Jokic at full capacity, like team, this team's really scary still. And they added Aaron Gordon at the deadline. I think they've got him still. So yeah, man, uh, Michael Porter jr. And so you're going to take a step. Uh, I want to use that as I want to use as a segue. All right. Give Cause me. I was thinking about the MVP odds and I don't have the information about predictions for this, but it was something I was thinking about recently. Um, buying or selling, uh, who do you think, um, is uh, going to be the most improved player next year in the NBA? Uh, Off the top of your head. Top oh, your head. my God. I guess I guess I want to say, hmm, who do I want to say is going to be the most improved player next year? Somebody who's taken a bit of a slide, but not like uh, most improved. I'm just okay. looking for, who Man, was it? Was tricky. I guess... So Julius Randle won last year. Yeah, and that was an anomaly. There was no reason for him to be as good as he was. Yeah, no he was on a team that had no other support. They've got Kemba there. I don't think the Knicks are going to be doing all that much next year. Uh, I'm trying to run down a few teams here. You know, I think 
I think it'd be awesome if it was someone like uh I'm not a I'm not a crazy fan of Orlando, but I do think if it was like Marco Fultz or somebody who was like a first or a top three lottery guy who who positioned himself to like really go off, that'd be really awesome. So just for shits, I guess I'm gonna I'm gonna say Marco Fultz. Cool, cool. I like it. I believe it. I mean, if he gets back, Jonathan Isaac gets healthy. That Orlando team could could make some commotion. Uh, yeah, I'm I'm a little bit worried that they're a bit uh, clogged up at point guard position with the addition of Jalen Suggs, Marco Fultz. They've got uh, Cole Anthony, Cole Anthony, yeah, Terrence Ross, who's more of a two shooting guard, but they've been kind of playing playing through him the last few years. Uh, yeah, so I'm I'd also I'd also say that that's a team that could easily uh, make some commotion at the deadline, but uh, we won't get too far into that. So, uh, for, yeah, yeah. So f- for the time being, I, I, I just got to say Marco Fultz. Marco Fultz, all right. My, I was thinking about this. I think I, it's hard for me to have the confidence because of the team and, like, what are the expectations of yeah, the team well, next year? Yeah, that's usually where the improvement comes, right? Yeah, totally, right? Like, you're seeing kind of a whole movement. Um, but I, I, I want to rep for uh, uh, one of our Canadian homeboys in uh, Shea Gilders Alexander. Bro, I think he's... I thought you were going to say Dylan Brooks. <laughs> now, just before you get into SGA, I want you to tell our listeners how you really feel about Dylan Brooks. Well, uh, man, I hope Dylan Brooks doesn't listen to this because he's going to hate me. He doesn't, he doesn't even know me. I don't even know him. So it's say. like. Why am I why am I judging Dylan Brooks? Uh, and I don't even know the guy. Uh, I just I don't know, man. It was he rubbed me the wrong way. It was like somewhere in Oregon. I'll give the caveat his effort and energy when he plays on Memphis. I respect it. I totally respect it. Like the guy seriously gives an F. Like he really cares and he sure, hustles yeah. and every play. You know, he thinks a little bit of myself when I'm playing some pickup ball, you know, just that high energy being your face kind of making some ugly plays getting under people's skin but in <laughs> oregon fights, throwing yeah. those starting fights <laughs> that's right that's right but in oregon i don't know man he just really rubbed me the wrong way it okay. was something maybe the cockiness or the attitude when they were going on that run um in the ncaa tournament whatever how many years ago that was now uh yeah so <laughs> dylan brooks man like all right all right come on dude We'll leave Dylan Brooks there for now. Uh, tell me why SGA is going to win the uh, most approved player for you. I think he's the best team on OKC. Um, he's got to be, what, now 22, 23? He's in his early 20s. I feel like he's hitting that year where he, he – if he is as good as a lot of players have projected early on in his career, he needs to take a leap, and it's got to be sooner or later, and I feel like the time is now. Um, you've got – I don't know. You've got some nice young talent, some nice pieces. Um, just take a swing for the fences. Like even if you're losing a bunch of games, but dropping a bunch of points and I don't know, just doing some intangibles that show that you're moving the needle on your skill. Um, I'm all for it because I would just love, I, I'm dying man to have a perennial all-star if not superstar you know canadian born player and i think shay has the makeup and the dna for that to happen um and he's just further along than some of these other young awesome prospects that we have around the league and don't get me wrong there's some amazing canadian prospects more than ever you know in the nba but i think shay just has the pieces in place to really make a splash. And, and why not do it this season? Like, even if you're necessarily going to not win a ton of games, you got a ton of pick assets and show something to Sam Presti that makes him reconsider, okay, you know, I've got a piece here. How can I build and make a championship team out of this? You know? I thought you were going to say, okay, see. We've got the right. I'm not, I'm not on my pun game today, man. <laughs> I am not even close to, to your level <laughs> right now. It's all good. Um, you know what it is? It's Ardberg. It's the ah. hard bag. Hard bag. Ah. Yeah. Mm, to success. <laughs> you know, uh, somebody I was just thinking that uh, probably has a better shot at, at most improved than Mark Fultz. Uh, I'll stick to Mark Fultz, but I do think, like I was saying, a, a top three kind of guy. I think yep. Lonzo Ball is going to get the most out of mm. this experience with uh, with being being with DeRozan, uh, Vucevic, and 
I guess with Levine, but uh, he he You're never really he never really had that kind of team in L.A. And yes, he had Zion, but that was not a, a you know a the strong, team around him. Just yeah, it, it was not a strong. It didn't bring the most out of him, and I I think he's got a shot at being uh, really taking another step. Yeah, 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 man. I'm all for it. I'm all for it. All right. So we're buying we're buying all of that. Yeah. Yeah, we're buying Markel Fultz stock. We're buying Shea Gil- uh, Gilgis Alexander stock. Uh, I wanted just to throw a couple. I don't want to go too in detail on this because one, the number is going to move. And I think it'd be really awesome further down the road before the season starts that we do like a longer podcast um, where we're doing, you know, kind of our over under bets for each team and can really dig into the projection of each team going into the season. But okay. The Vegas over under uh, win total projections came out recently. And there was just a couple teams I was looking at that I thought, Hey, you know, like, are you buying or selling on this? Like, how do you feel in terms of how, you know, the sport betting world is thinking about some of these teams going in next year. So first off the first team um, that everyone's thinking it's going to have the most amount of wins. Well, I'm sure you could figure this out. Who, who do you think is going to be the, the, the number Brooklyn. one team uh, Brooklyn. So their, their projection is 55.5 wins. Yeah. Not bad. They'll would probably you, do it. Yep. Would you buy that? Do you think they're gonna? Yeah, I buy that. I'm okay, buy, okay, I'd buy. Okay, I'd say over. You're going over, over on Brooklyn. Yeah. Um. The Toronto Raptors. Mm. So last year, all right, I'm buying. A, I don't even it, care it, the numbers. <laughs> I'm buying. Last year it was a 72 game season. Toronto Raptors won 27 and 45. Okay. okay? They won That's 27 games. Terrible. <laughs> it was brutal, but we kind of knew like. Yeah. Getting towards the end there, yeah. they were throwing away some games. So this this year, they're projected at 36.5. So given, all right, it was a 72 game last season. So you're adding 10 games. So if they won 27 games last year and they won every game in a full season last year, that would be 37 games. Okay. Total. If they won every single game last year, which they probably won of, say they would have won 50-50, they still would have been under the 36.5 mark. Do you think... The Toronto Raptors team is better this year, and they're going to have some more wins at 36.5. Are you buying? Are you going over or under? I'm going under, man. I'm only going under because I think that um, I think they 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 need. They're just not there yet. They they're still in the rebuild, and it's going to take another couple of years to be over that. I think. I think the competition around them is way too stiff for them right now. No, I'd love to be surprised on that, but I'm I'm selling. So you don't even think they're going to get into a playing tournament? No, next year. No, I don't. Oh, I'd love to. I'd love to. I love. I, mean, I, I know. To. Absolutely, I know. and I want Scotty Barnes to be Rookie of the Year. But I, uh, he's a couple years away. That's he's just, a couple that's years. Exactly what I'm saying. That's what I'm saying. And yeah. and there's some, you know, some interesting. But we also see, <laughs> we also see some of the additions that they're adding. And I'm like, who? One, yeah, one, who? And two, that's not going to help. <laughs> yeah, who did they add a couple of days ago? It was like my I can't Chick- even name it. I, I don't even know what his name is. I've never <laughs> even heard of him. I don't even I know what team he was on. Play. Yeah, he played overseas somewhere. Like, oh, okay. So, so I shouldn't I shouldn't say that uh, he's going to be a nobody because Toronto's got a really great development system. They've proven to be good at pro scouting and amateur scouting. So, uh, we'll see. I I just I'm I'm selling for now. Yeah, you want you want to hear something that's funny? The last two teams for the over under win projection. So these are like the two worst teams in terms of wins that okay. the Vegas odds are putting at. Yeah. At 29, the Orlando Magic with 23.5. And at number 30, Oklahoma City with 22.5 wins. <laughs> so there goes their most improved players, I guess, out the window. Yeah. Um <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, we'll be making adjustments midseason, I'm sure. Oh, for sure. For sure. I mean, a part of me thinks that Houston might try to really tank next year. They're at 26.5. So and part of me thinks Jalen Green's not going to let that happen. <sighs> Could be right. Could be right. I want to know quickly from you, uh, is John Wall going to be a, a, a Boston Celtic next year? Fuck you. <laughs> I'm sorry if we're not allowed, if we have to censor that out, but no, fuck you, dude. <laughs> Are you kidding me? Yeah, Are dude, you, you guys got a, there's a massive hole uh, right oh, now. Oh, yeah. And we're going to sign 
we're going to sign John Wall. Let me just pull this up on my phone. It was like literally an article I was reading. The top 15 worst NBA contracts, okay? <laughs> we already talked about number one with Kevin Love. You want to know who number two is? John Wall. He gets next season, okay, uh-huh. 20, 21, 22. He's making $44.3 Ooh, million. Dollars. Ew, 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 ew. 22, he's only played tw- like two seasons in the last yeah, four or five yeah, yeah. years. 22 23 he has a player option so he can commit to it if he wants and he makes 47.4 effing million dollars are you kidding me that's insane Mm -hmm. for a guy who's barely gonna play for a team that's gonna be projected to be like the third worst team in the nba like i just i just don't think he finishes his season with houston especially if you're talking about tanking so what do they do they buy him out yeah Buy him out or trade him. I would. I'd trade buy, him to I'd Boston. It's very likely. <laughs> you just want him to come back. Okay, you know what? Here's the caveat. I will take John Wall's contract. Well, no, I will not take his contract. We will buy him out, and then we'll do like a three-team trade. Okay? Horford for Wall. So we will move. Um, uh, we're going to move uh, John Wall to the Boston Celtics. Okay? Marcus Smart is going to go to Toronto. What the fuck? <laughs> And uh uh Houston will pick up um I don't know Chris uh, Boucher. <laughs> yeah, Chris Boucher <laughs> out of Toronto. All right, that's a very even deal, probably the most even deal that we've ever talked about. We'll e- even talk level about of <laughs> even level of saltiness. I, I think <laughs> we don't agree on that. Houston would be elated. Okay. Yeah, Dylan Brooks has to get involved somehow. Yeah, somehow. Yeah, yeah. yeah Dylan yeah. Brooks has to uh Come in, uh, hang out with Chris for a week or something like that. Um, nice, yeah, okay, man. So, well, there's gonna be a lot more going on. Um, can I? I just want to say one thing before we end today. Hit me. Um, so I just want to give a shout out to uh, Ardbeg <laughs> to Ardbeg Ugadale <laughs> uh, to success. Uh, so I've I don't know. I think for a number of years, because I was a Boston, you know, I'm a diehard Boston fan. Okay. Um, I started, you know, watching the Celtics, ironically, in 08, the year that they won. Mm-hmm. Um, and I've just loved, I love the team ever since. And one of the amazing writers who's followed the Boston Celtics for multiple decades, uh, Jackie McMullen, um, amazing, amazing person, writer, speaker, um, a, a woman um, trailblazer for uh, journalism in sports in the NBA. Uh, today was her last day on ESPN, so she's oh retired. God. She's still gonna she's still gonna be doing some pods um, from the sounds of it. Still gonna be doing some projects here and there, but the con- kind of concurrent writing that she's done year after year for ESPN is coming to an end. And uh, I just wanted yeah. to give a shout out to Jackie McMullen because she's she's awesome. Cheers to her, to Jackie McMullen. Cheers to the success she started in the early '80s with the Celtics, and she covered one of the most amazing dynasties of any team ever in the NBA. Um, had some of the most heartfelt interviews with Larry Bird and all those guys. So I just yeah, I got I got a soft spot for her. I just want to give her a shout out. That's awesome. And, and uh, also what a joke ESPN. I don't know if that was a mutual decision, but I'm quite certain that it probably was not. And ESPN has been on uh well, if you want to know more about uh, how I feel about ESPN, jump over to uh, you can listen to hat trick uh, sports podcast every Monday on the same network. Um, what a joke. <laughs> what a yeah. joke. And what a loss. What a huge loss for that organization. Uh, you know, she's going to make her way and, and she's going to continue to to have the following that she has. But well, um, I think goodness. I think from the sounds of it, I was listening to this Bill Simmons podcast with her and she was saying that, you know, like I think it was really personal. You know, she wants to spend some time with her family. But I mean, you could be right. There's definitely a factor with the SPN. The company is a joke. Man, between um, Bill Simmons, Rachel Nichols, McMullen, oh, yeah. Max Conman's on his way out. Amazing, amazing, amazing people who are trailblazing, doing their own thing now moving forward. So, like, kudos yep. to all those guys. Cheers, yep. cheers to all of them. Uh, well, thanks again, Chris. Thanks again, uh, everybody, for listening, tuning in to the Backyard Basketball Podcast presented by the Ordinary Podcasting Network. You can find out uh, more by liking and subscribing. You've got an Instagram page. You can 
follow and uh, you can find our podcast anywhere you stream any of your podcasts and we'll catch you next Wednesday. Cheers. Peace.